My name is Larry Henry Taylor. I'm uh, originally from London, so I was born in London, Kentucky in 1946. Do you have any family members that are serving or have served in the military? I do have a family member that has served. Uh, my brother, Bill, uh, Bill Taylor served uh, as a medic. Uh, he just had finished graduating college and was drafted. And uh, he's still on top of his game academically, so he was a top student in his medic class and uh, became a, a flight crew medic. And then uh, my sister, Janice Hoskins, uh, her son, John Hoskins, is currently serving as an MP. Uh, he's stationed at Fort Knox currently. What were you doing before you entered the service? Before I entered the service, I had a part-time job, and I was going to college. And uh, I was taking maybe 16, 15, 16 hours, uh, just kind of having a good time. In which branch of the military did you serve? And did you enlist or were you drafted? I served in the United States Army. I was drafted. I was drafted in 1966. What happened when you departed for training camp and during your early days of training? Well, first of all, I got the draft notice when I was drafted. I got the draft notice in the mail to report to the uh, local draft board. When I got there, there was probably 10 to 12 buses, and we were loaded on those buses. Back then, you could only get about 40 people on a bus. Nowadays, they can get 60 or more on a school bus. These were buses similar to school buses, and uh, but they had the Army green color, and we were transported to Louisville uh, to the induction center. And once we got there, there was five or six guys I grew up with that we were you know, stay close together throughout that ordeal. And that night, we they housed us in motels. Uh, but that night, Pat Feaster, Dale Campbell, and Duke House, uh, Duke Hughes, uh, we all stayed in the same motel room. We worked it out where we could be together, talking about the unknown, you know, the unknown of being in the Army, being in the military. So I was with some local guys right up until the time we kind of got separated once we were inducted into the service. Do you recall any of your instructors? Have any specific memories about them? Uh, there's two or three early on I do. Um, I, had a, uh, re I recall some of the instructors I had in basic. Uh, one of them was Sergeant Kane. Uh, he was a very forceful individual. Uh, we want to make sure we learned uh, the military code, military rules, and how to conduct ourselves. And then in some advanced training, uh, the instructor was more geared toward teaching us how to survive, how to use weapons, weapons, uh, how to become familiar with first aid and things of that nature. Uh, we had some very good instructors. How did you adapt to military life, including the physical regimen, barracks, food, and social life? It wasn't very difficult to adjust to military life. Uh, I was an athlete in high school. I was still in real top physical condition. And the military, you know, at the beginning was all about conditioning, uh, exerting ourselves physically, doing push-ups, running, uh, carrying our gear, uh, marching for long distances. So it wasn't difficult at all for me to adjust. Eating, the food was good. We had three meals a day. Uh, the only difference was there was no time to get a snack in between meals. And, uh, you know, uh, trying to adjust to uh, sleeping with, uh, we had bunks side by side, uh, double bunks. And uh, trying to uh, uh, sleep and get adjusted to that aspect of it was uh, very difficult. Have one bathroom that had probably 10 shower stalls and uh, maybe uh, 10 commodes on one room. 
and that was kind of something to get adjusted to. But other than that, they fed us well in our training. Uh, you know, we had a, 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 a roof over our head, a nice place to sleep, just so many of us together. Where did you serve? Where did I serve? I served in uh, Vietnam primarily. Uh, I was first, when I was drafted, I went to Fort Knox for my basic training, Fort Polk, Louisiana for some advanced infantry training, and then on to Fort Hood, Texas for some special training in weapons. And then when I finished that aspect of my training, I was shipped to Vietnam. Do you have any memories of your service abroad that you'd like to share? Well, at one point in my life, I tried to submerge my memories, suppress my memories, and not think about those. But at some point, those memories come back. There's a lot of horrible memories, death and destruction, that I'd rather not go into detail about. We had heavy losses. I was in an infantry unit, so we had a lot of losses. One of, the, one of the great memories I have was I was with three guys from London, Kentucky. John Sicer worked at UPS. He and I were in the same unit together. I saw him at least twice a week. Chuck Hubbard and I, Charles Hubbard, he went to Hazel Green High School. Uh, we were in the same squad together. And then Jim Michaels, that lives in Sublimity now, that worked at to get the uh, American Greeting Card, uh, I ran into him over there in Vietnam. Now here we are 12 hours away from uh, you, you know, my home here in, uh, in London, Kentucky, and running into guys like that, it's, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing. It just proves how small the world is. But uh, we really enjoyed being able to talk to each other and uh, speak of things back home and what our moms were saying in letters, uh, that sort of thing was, uh, you know, that's a good memory that does stand out. How did you stay in touch with your family and friends back home? Well, the only way we had was to stay in touch with our family back home was uh, through the snail mail, you know, United States Postal Service. It didn't cost us anything. We didn't have to put a stamp on our envelope. All we had to have is a piece of paper and a pencil and an envelope to, to write a note home. And uh, there was one time during the, I was there for 12 months, so there was one time during my tour that I had an opportunity call home. That was a very special treat. So the phone call went out over microwave and uh, it, it called into California and from California to London was by ham radio. And uh, B. Campbell here in London was the uh, person here that took the call from California and transmitted it then by landline to mom and dad's home just about a mile or so away from where he lived during sublimity. And we were able to communicate, but every time I would finish saying something to mom, I would have to say over to her so she would know to start talking. And, uh, but anyway, it was a unique situation uh, that I was just uh, so proud to be able to speak to my parents and brothers and sisters uh, after so many months from not being able to talk to them, you know. What did you do for recreation when you were off duty? It seems our recreation was very limited in Vietnam. I didn't have any recreation, uh, except one time I do recall coming back in. Uh, I only came back into the base camp three times during my tour. And uh, one of the guys I served with was Rob Driggers, D-R-I-G-G-E-R-S. And uh, he, had, he had graduated from Murakow University and uh, had played basketball for them. And so here he comes out with his flip-flops 
and wanting to shoot some hoops, he called it. I said, man, I don't know if I want to do that or not. I need to rest. But he says, uh, come on, I want to show you how to shoot some basketball. And I hadn't told him that I played in high school. And uh, but he got out there in those flip-flops, and we're, he slammed dunking the basketball in flip-flops. But after, after uh, many years later, I find out that after his tour was up, came back, and he played professional basketball for eight years in Mexico. So yeah, that was a treat just finding that out. But uh, he was a good one. He was one of the good guys. And uh, but uh, I do remember that about our recreation. That was the only recreation I can recall. Where were you when the war ended? When the war ended for me. Uh, in 1968, February the 5th, 68, it, uh, the war was, I was back home. That's when I came back. But uh, on March the 29th, 1973, all troops was pulled out of Vietnam. And But uh, the war still was going on. It went on for another two years until 1975. But, uh, you know, as far as the, the, the war, I came back from the war I left Vietnam, but I don't know if the war ever left me. Uh, the war stayed with me, and uh, it's been it's been it's been a tough ordeal to deal with. But uh, uh, battles go on all the time, you know. And uh, so I'd say the war is still going on in in some regards. How did you return home? How did I return home was by a 727 airliner. That was the, I guess, the uh, top of the line aircraft at that time. Uh, when I went over, we went over through uh, uh, from California to Hawaii to Guam, in that direction. But when I came back, now you got to understand, I left, it was 115, 120 degrees in Vietnam. But when we came back, they flew us to Alaska and then down to California. And we got into Alaska. Here I was, short sleeve shirts, all of us. We had no provisions or nothing provided for cold weather. And we went into Alaska and got off that aircraft for refu refueling. And uh, you talk about cold, it was cold. I mean, it was a shock. Uh, you know, being faced with that uh, extreme cold temperature, it's probably 15, 20 below zero there in Alaska where we had landed. But uh, that really stands out. I mean, I remember that just like it happened yesterday uh, about going into that terminal uh, and coming out of that aircraft and it being so cold. And we flew into California, uh, and I was really, I didn't count Alaska as being home. I guess at that time, and uh, when I flew into California, I felt like I was almost home. How were you received by your family and community? Well, I was I was well received by family. Certainly, there's no question about that. They were really happy to see me, and just uh, it tickled to death. And of course, I was the same way. I was glad to be back, glad to reunite with family. Uh, community was somewhat, I was somewhat well received by our local community. Uh, the question though, how was I received, or how was we received upon our returns? Uh, when I came back into California and came off the tarmac there walking into the airport, uh, there were people throwing lettuce at us. They were throwing oranges at us, but there was this big uh, chain link fence that was about 12 foot high. Otherwise, the things would have been, been hitting me and the other guys that was walking on the tarmac of that airport there, our strip. We wouldn't receive very well in California. How did you readjust to civilian life? How did I readjust to civilian life? It's been a process, I think. Uh, when I 
first arrived home in uh, 1968. I tried to, to get back in with some people I knew. They were different, I thought. And I found out it was me that was a little bit different. Uh, I felt much older than them. I felt like I was, I, you know, I got to understand that I was 20 year old, so I felt like I was 45, maybe even close to 50. And it was very difficult. I found myself dating much older ladies. I didn't date the 20 year old or the 18, 19 year old. I was dating a lot of times older people. So a couple guys I knew, we went down to watch uh, the state tournament uh, down at uh, uh, down in Louisville at that time it was. Johnny No and uh, Charlie Brown and I went out. And Charlie was in the army at that time, so we were, met him. Johnny and I met Charlie Brown down there in Louisville. And they were talking about getting a date. Johnny Johnny says, uh, Charlie, can you get me a date? And he says, Yeah, we'll all have a date, but we're going to have to go by the nursing home to get Taylor a date. You know, they knew that I liked, I guess, uh, uh, they were, they knew that my age was much older than what it actually was. Have you remained in contact with or reunited with fellow veterans? I have reunited with many of the guys I served with that survived. Uh, one of the first ones I met with in 2010 uh, Joe Britton from Atlanta, Georgia. He and his wife came up and stayed a week in London. We were together, uh, you know, all day long up until the late hours. Uh, it was a great reunion. We we uh, talked about things from. I mean, we picked up on a conversation that we were talking about in Vietnam in 1967. And and, it, and we picked up on that conversation like it had never been any time elapsed. It's just uh, uh, when I first saw him, I recognize. I mean, I recognized him right off. I recognized his voice, uh, his body language, still the same. I, I just uh, it was just a great, great feeling. Well, he was the first one I re reunited with, and but since then I've reunited with several guys, the Rob Driggers. For example, spoke of earlier, uh, he's he lives in Louisville, and uh, he coached basketball there in Louisville for 30 years, high school basketball. And uh, I, when I first saw him, we were at the Gaunt House there on the river, and uh, his wife was with him, and I noticed him signing the document with his right hand. I said, "Something's wrong. You're left-handed. Why aren't you writing left-handed?" His wife looked up and she says, who are you, you know? I said, well, I know your husband from years ago, from Vietnam days, and he's left-handed. She said his left hand got injured so bad, he had to learn to write right-handed. So, you know, anyway, that was a great, we, we still stay in touch by email and that sort of thing. But uh, And then others, I've, I've got up with others. Uh, I go to some reunions now. Uh, I've been to about eight reunions, so I, I've, I've been with the guys. Are you a member of any veterans' organizations? Am I a member of any veterans' organizations? I, I am. Uh, when I first came out of the service in 68, Byron Hillard, uh, he was a World War II veteran, came to me and talked to me and tried to help me to readjust and get back into the community. And he invited me to join the Disabled American Veterans, which I'm still with the Disabled American Veterans. But I've been with uh, the VFW, uh, Vietnam Veterans of America, uh, the Blue Spaders, that's the unit I served with in Vietnam, the Black Lions, another unit I served with in Vietnam, and the Big Red Warren Association, uh, I'm a member of all those organizations. Uh, the uh, Blue Spaders and, and Black Lions and Big Red One all hold reunions each year at some place in the United States. This, just this uh, past June, my wife and I were in Fort Benning, Georgia, 
I was in Columbus, Georgia for a reunion there. Uh, we've had uh, reunions at uh, Fort Knox and Fort Campbell, just, just scattered all over the place. Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, but it's really great being back with those men of valor just to be able to socialize with them and speak to them, talk to them. What have you done since separating from the military? What have I done since separating from the military? Well, first of all, I went back to school when I got out of service. And uh, uh, after, after school, I, I got a job and it uh, didn't last very long, but I had a decent job. And uh, a, a World War II veteran came to me. His name is Upi Yaden. And uh, Upi really treated me special and uh, was a big help to me. But uh, he offered me a job at Levi Jackson State Park. He was, uh, Upi was the uh, camp director, I guess you'd call him. And they call him a ranger now. But at that time, he was camp director park director, and uh, he offered me a job as camp director at the campground, and I jumped on it real quick and enjoyed that and liked that very much. But, and then, you know, that lasted for a short period of time. I went to work for, uh, at that time, was Chapel's Dury, and uh, we didn't stay there very long, but uh, eventually the job, my next job was the job that, uh, I made a career out of it, and that was with Contel. It was a phone company, uh, a, a mighty large phone company, but it was uh, here in London was uh, uh, the main office for this area. But uh, anyway, I made my career working for the phone company, and my retirement was through Verizon. There was a, along the way, GTE and Contel merged, and, and then, uh, once they merged, uh, another deal came up with Bell Atlantic and GTE, and Bell Atlantic merged, and the new name came out, came out Verizon. So that's how Verizon came into existence. But uh, Verizon separated from the landline operations and went strictly with cell phones. How did your wartime experiences affect your life? How did my wartime experience affect my life? I think it had a tremendous impact on my life. First of all, I was a very arrogant, uh, hot-headed individual. I think my experiences in Vietnam has caused me to be a more humble type person. I value life greatly, all life, animal life, making a difference. All life is special. And um, I think that uh, that's just like hunting. For example, I have brothers that love to hunt, and they invite me to go hunting all the time. But I, I just, I won't go hunting because I don't want to take the life of a deer or a turkey or squirrel or whatever the hunt may be about. What are some life lessons you learned from military service? What are some life lessons I've learned from military service? I think to be organized, to be disciplined, to have, uh, to be a person of honor, uh, are some of the things I've learned. I've learned to, uh, how to cope with stress, uh, those type of things. How has your military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? How, how has uh, my military experience affected my view of the war and military in general? That's a real good question. And I think that, uh, you know, I was ready. I was a patriotic young person. And I was ready to do my duty and serve my country. That's what I was supposed to do, and I knew that. 
But I think that uh, while I was in combat, I recognized that uh, right away that uh, our leaders should be doing things they, they weren't doing. Uh, for example, they would send us out on patrols and uh, we were human bait for the enemy to draw the enemy out just to find out for sure where they're at. So our main part of our uh, company could come in and take the enemy out. They were willing, our military was willing to sacrifice lives so they could take lives of the enemy. And then, uh, then I noticed that uh, uh, the only way I knew some things were going on was through stars and stripes and, and uh, what we heard through mail from our parents and things. That, that, that war is a very political thing. And uh, that's what divides our nation a lot of times is because politics gets so involved with war. And there'll be people with, uh, I mean, our war uh, with Afghanistan is going on right now, but during our operation Iraqi Freedom, there would be people say, I support the troops, but I don't support the war. Well, that's an impossible thing. That's an impossible way to view things. You, you either are all in or not in at all, in my opinion. Uh, but I think that uh, for us to have the freedom we have as the United States of America, there's going to be, there has been wars and there's going to be more wars in the future. What message would you like to leave for future generations who will view or hear this interview? I'd like to, for the future generation that may view this interview, just to realize that uh, war is not fun and games. You know, these kids have got these video games now. That they're playing and, and they push a button and it kills the enemy or uh, they push a button and it kills the monster. You know, it isn't like that. Combat is not like that. It's, uh, it isn't fun and games. It's only fun and games for people that's never been in war. War is a very serious thing. And if we were, if we're in war, we should go out, all out, with all we've got to finish the war and take the enemy out as fast as possible and not tarry on for 10 years or 12 years or 13 years. It needs to be done and get, over, get it over with as quick as possible. Is there anything you feel like we haven't discussed or should be added to this interview? I don't know that there's anything that we haven't discussed or not. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of memories I have. And uh, one of the things that uh, drags me down is all the negative things that happened in war override or dominate all the good things that may have happened, all the pleasurable memories uh, get blocked out because of all the bad things that occurred. Uh, there, there has been, I went 42 years without having a firearm because I didn't want to pull the trigger again. And uh, about six years ago, I bought a BB gun to, for my grandson to see, you know, to show him how to use a BB gun safely. And, uh, you know, I got that BB gun out myself and shot it a few times to see if I could still shoot. And I could. I could still shoot. And, uh, but I still didn't have a firearm. And uh, I think uh, some of the other veterans that I uh, socialized with from time to time invited me to go to the firing range with them. And uh, I told him I couldn't go. I didn't have a firearm. Oh, we'll loan you a firearm. And uh, eventually I went out and bought me a, a firearm and, and was able again once to shoot a, a rifle. Uh, you know, it's a, but uh, there's a lot of emotional attachment uh, that, uh, to pulling a trigger. Pulling a trigger is a, not a very pleasurable thing. 
So if there are any future uh, people that may be watching this video, it's a serious thing. You know, uh, a gun don't kill people, people kill people. Whether it's in war or whether it's out here on the street. A firearm, you know, I, I do have one for self-defense. And uh, that's the only thing it'd be used for is if, if someone were to break into my home and try to harm my family. I would once again have to pull the trigger.